Hi. Um, when Alex suggested that I give this talk on the concepts, I think his sense was I might be able to give a kind of an intuitive feeling about concepts, kind of put into balance the sort of very language technical ideas of Bjarna or the very mathematically technical ideas of Dave Musser. So that's what I'm going to try to do. It sort of intimidates me a little bit because um, as um, some of the speakers who have come before me have said, Alex, when he takes, um, when, when Alex tries to teach about these ideas, there's thousands of years of mathematics, um, there's many, many decades of computer science, and there is this collaboration of, of his own path through this, which in his courses he sometimes mentions. If, if you read his interviews, you'll learn a lot more about that, and I really recommend that because um, it's sort of all these things are tied together. Um, but I'm going to do something different. I don't have that much time. <laughs> so I'm going to try to go straight to the core. What is a concept? The definition that's in elements of programming is pretty technical. It's more like Dave Musser's version. Um, but it's best to start with an example. And it's best to start maybe with an example that Alex came to back when he was smoking a cigar, <laughs> roughly speaking, even before that. Um, if, imagine if you have an associative operator like addition or multiplication. Um, that lets you regroup a sequence of operations. You move the parentheses around. And Alex observed um, that that liberty to move the parentheses around without changing the overall value of the expression means that, for example, you could come up with a balanced tree. Um, and Alex was thinking about parallel execution at the time. This was the 1970s, and parallel computers were, were one of the important things to think about. So a parallel tree, expression tree, would have the most opportunity for, for concurrent operations. Even in a sequential setting, it can sometimes be, and quite often it can be, a good way to proceed. Something like, say, um, stable partition in elements of programming, you'll, you'll see, takes advantage of that. Um, so what's going on here? We have, we have some abstract idea or property, like associativity of an operator, and there's this connection to an algorithm or a group of algorithms, like um, summation or or repetition of any associative operator. Um, and I guess another way of looking at this is, suppose you have a lot of algorithms. Concepts are a way of, of organizing those algorithms. So for example, suppose you think of every possible way of inserting the parentheses there, and every possible replacement of the little circle with some operator like addition or multiplication. A lot of possible algorithms. If you know that the operator is associative, then you can actually collapse it down. You say, well, I'm going to keep the balanced order, and I'm going to maybe go left to right, and ah, throw out all the others, and, and that'll be good. And if you have a language like C++, which I hope you do, um, you can write a template function once and for all. It'll have a functional parameter for the operator, and you're done. The compiler will generate the code that you need. So. An association between some semantic property, here it's very simple, associativity, um, and a group of algorithms. So pardon me for using my cheat sheet here. Um, so over, that, that was in the late 70s, and Dave, uh, Alex was starting to work with Dave Musser around that time, and Deepak Kapoor, who's, who's not here today. And it was sort of in the world of mathematics, functional programming. But over the next few years, with other collaborators, he started looking at memory, um, mutability of the memory, the random access of the memory, not just walking down a list. Started looking at languages like Ada that could have, that had a strong type system, could help you express some of the other aspects, like keep, keep the bookkeeping straight of, of what you're doing. And then, he ran into a guy named Bjarne Strustrup in a language C++. And I think I wasn't there at the time. I can imagine it's sort of like a tectonic plates kind of <laughs> rubbing a little bit. Um, 
probably some shock waves generated. And I think there was very positive um, impact on both of them. I think what ended up was a C++ with a very powerful template mechanism and a standard template library that was very powerful. And I don't think um, it could have come into existence any other way. Um, and so um, the next version of C++, I don't think Bjarne mentioned it, maybe, maybe he did, is really going to have a formal language construct for, for concepts. And that's been a long time coming, but it's going to allow us to write a piece of code. This is kind of a toy example, but it's, 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 it's what I alluded to a couple of slides back, applying an arbitrary associative operator um, and, and doing it in a balanced way. And so there's a couple of concepts, the forward iterator in green and the binary operation. And the next line, the requires clause, is actually tying together the idea that the iterator or the pointer-like thing, if you dereference it, you'll get something of a type that matches up with the binary operation that you're about to apply to it. So that's a useful thing. Um, the associativity, we have to pass, we have to express a different way with it precondition because you might pass an operator in that's not associative. That would be bad. This wouldn't do what you wanted. So I guess maybe Dave Musser's terminology would say we have a proof obligation that every time you invoke this procedure, you need to establish that the particular operator you're passing in is associative. Um, so I, I can't resist throwing in a little code from elements of programming. <laughs> This is really the better way to do balanced rejection. This is, according to Don Knuth, John McCarthy came up with this idea. Maybe he did, but Alex wrote the code, and it's classic Alex code. It's, it's a little too small to really read it, but it's walking along a sequence of elements bottom up and pairing each even element with the next odd one and then saving them in this interesting binary counter until it's time you know, to, to combine them with, with their appropriate matching thing. Um, so that's the kind of code that you get if you're Alex. Okay, now I want to shift gears a little bit, try to talk about sort of the setting when Alex started doing this research with, with Dave and others. Um, and I need to sort of go back to the beginnings of programming. Um, it's sort of a truism from hardware designers that the programmers won't get started if you have a new, new system until the hardware is actually finished. And that was kind of true with programming. Well, yes, three and 4,000 years ago, or 3,000 years ago, say, people were designing algorithms, but they didn't have programming languages. Maybe, maybe um, Babbage and Lady Lovelace were doing a little programming, but really it was sort of the late 40s as the first iron came into existence that the first programming was getting going. And it was pretty impressive. They went with, from sort of flow charting and inductive assertions and calling conventions. And by the time Wilkes, Wheeler, and Gill published that book, 1951, Addison Wesley, our, which is our, our publisher, <laughs> um, they actually had a fairly nice um, subroutine library in the back of the book with, with a variety of, of math routines. Interestingly, they had to start with a division, which wasn't an instruction of the computer, but they ended up with, with you know, matrix arithmetic and a variety of equation solving. Um, then the early um, languages that came just a few years after, like Fortran and Algol, they were basically modeling the machine data types of integer and floating point arithmetic and linear addressing of memory, namely the array, but they were quite useful languages. Fortran is actually still here today in high performance computing. I think modern programmers would, could, could easily pick up these languages and use them. So it's kind of interesting how fast we got that far along. Then in the 60s, a couple more things. Languages like Pascal added some higher level ways of, of, of using pointers and, and, and records. And Bjarne is kind of, you know, it, there were, there were some problems there. It took another few decades to, to really get it all right. Um, the language there that's very interesting is Simula 67. It's not one that's well known at all, but it actually provided the class. So there is a way to define a whole new type with your operations, not just the ones that came with, with the integers. Um, so that 
it's sort of leading on onto languages of the future. Um, okay, so what happened next? In the 70s, there was this crazy explosion of, of work in programming language design. A lot of it centered around the idea of an abstract data type, which is really taking that class from Simula, but adding a couple of things, saying we have an interface, we have a set of operations, and we have encapsulated data. So in Simula, the data was, everything was public. These typical 1970s languages, everything is private, and there's typically no inheritance. Um, and a lot of these languages included a brand new language, excuse me, a lot of these papers that were being written in this field of abstract data types proposed a language. I mean, this is a list I found in a bibliography in 1982 or 83. There were 870 papers on abstract data types, and I think about 50 or so languages, almost none of which were implemented. The ones that are slightly large and larger type are ones that I was familiar with. <laughs> a firm was by Dave Musser, um, and a few of those were actually implemented. Yes, a firm was one of the ones that was implemented. Um, so, so here's an example from Clue, which was, it was implemented at MIT. It wasn't really used anywhere else that I, that I know of, but, but it, it's representative of what was going on there. And so the idea is Clue stands for cluster, um, which is an abstract data type. A set of operations, the data is encapsulated. It can only be seen inside. This particular one is implementing a, a priority queue or the, the heap data structure. Um, the language is kind of sophisticated. It, it actually is, has type parameterization. So the type of things that are in the heap can be, um, can be selected when you're creating one of these things. But they don't have any way to specify the properties of those types. So when you call create, you need to pass in a procedure that takes two arguments. But you can't say it's a, you know, that it's a strict weak ordering. So that's, that's unfortunate. And another interesting thing is, if we look at STL, it has a heap, but it's, it's just some algorithms. You, you, there's make heap and push heap and pop heap, is heap, and they'll work with any linear structure that's random accessible. So you could have a static array, you could have an array in your local frame, you could have a heap allocated array, and Alex's heap would work. This one is sort of, you get what, what it is. Okay, so, where is all this taking us? Um, uh, to quote, or not to sort of paraphrase Thoreau, <laughs> in the 1970s, while many stepped to the music of the abstract data type, Alex heard a different drummer. So the middle column is sort of what people were mostly doing in the 1970s. This notion of an abstract data type, um, an interface, often a, in some cases a formal specification, in other cases an informal specification, encapsulated data. Um, and, and the encapsulation protected what's called the representation invariant. So in other words, if you're trying to create a heap and you need to know that um, each element is, is greater than its two children, you can be guaranteed no one's going to get in there and mess that up. And sometimes that's useful, but not all. It's not so important all the time. The right-hand column is, is sort of Alex's view of the world. So you're, you're thinking about the algorithms of the world, and concepts are just the glue between the algorithms. So there's usually an inter each concept brings along an interface for an abstract, excuse me, for an associative operator, the interface is simply a single binary operation. That's, that's a, a, a skinny interface. If, if the concept is, say, an iterator, then you have a successor operation and a dereferencing operation. Maybe you also have a predecessor if it's, if it's a bidirectional iterator. Um, if it's random access iterator, then you, then you have a way to add an arbitrary amount to the iterator. Okay, so there's an interface, but Alex isn't concerned. He's sort of looking the opposite direction. He's saying, let's protect the purity of the algorithm from the nasty details of, of this thing that, that the algorithm is written in terms of. You know, an example, suppose you're writing an algorithm that's using an arbitrary input stream then you want to be sure that you can use dereferencing and, and successor. But if there's a get size, maybe because it's a disk stream, you shouldn't use that. 
that's, that's not part of the abstraction. <laughs> so the concept is protecting the purity of, of, and generality of your algorithms, the fact that they will then be able to work in the, in the largest number of cases. So for STL, which Alex wrote 20 years ago, we're still using it, and we'll probably be using it for many decades to come. So this picture kind of captures things for me. You know, do you see two faces <laughs> or a cup? <laughs> and it's looking up or looking down from that interface. There the interface is, is the two lines. In the case of an abstract data type, are we looking down into its implementation or are we looking up into the, the algorithm that, that takes advantage of that? So I'd like to close with just a few words about working with Alex. Um, it's been a high point of my career. I can, it was a long career and I'm very pleased to have ended it in that way. We came from different backgrounds, um, but we found really a huge amount of commonality. You know, there's John Backus as an example, somebody that we had each been influenced by you know, 40 years ago, but we didn't know that until now. So what I'd like to do is simply read the last paragraph of Elements of Programming. Programming is an iterative process, studying useful problems, finding efficient algorithms for them, distilling the concepts underlying the algorithms, and organizing the concepts and algorithms into a coherent mathematical theory. Each new discovery adds to the permanent body of knowledge, but each has its limitations. Thank you, Alex. <laughs>